Hello and welcome to the Law Eagle Minute. I'm Eric Townsend, the owner and founder of the Law Eagles. We represent policyholders against insurers who deny or underpay claims and anyone injured in an accident. I'd like to welcome Ben Embry. Uh, he is the owner and principal attorney at Embry Family Law. As a family law attorney, Ben represents victims of domestic violence. Uh, with the isolate in place orders due to the coronavirus pandemic, victims of domestic violence are stuck in a house with their assailants. Uh, so Ben's going to discuss how the legal process works for domestic violence and how to get help. How are you doing today, Ben? Good, Eric. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, no problem. So like Eric mentioned, I'm Ben Embry, the principal of attorney of Embry Family Law. I'm a certified family law specialist, which means I was deemed by the state of California or the state bar of California to be a specialist in the area of family law. Interesting is that you have to be determined to be a specialist to even say that you're a specialist. Um, Eric's right. <laughs> that doesn't I happen practice. all the time. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so as Eric mentioned, we our primary focus is family law. So I've been practicing for 10 years um, in the area, exclusive areas of family law and bankruptcy. Um, family law is a broad area of law. Uh, the easy way to say it is that I'm a divorce attorney, but there's also other areas in family law, child custody, child support, um, spousal support, and as Eric mentioned, domestic violence. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ben. Uh, I've known Ben a long time. He is an excellent family law attorney. He knows his stuff inside and out. And I know that he's done a lot with uh, domestic violence cases. And that's the reason why I had him on, wanted to bring him on the show today to make sure the audience and anybody that you may know, anybody that's, that's listening to this, if you know somebody else that's been affected or it's being affected by domestic violence, get this information to them. I mean, it's a, it's concerning. It's a concerning time to be stuck in a house with someone that's, you know, potentially harming you, you know, actually, actually harming you or doing something to you or just the threat of it itself. That's a terrible position to be in. Uh, so Ben, I'm, you know, we were discussing this a little bit and uh, we were talking about domestic violence in these cases. Uh, what's the legal process to obtain a domestic violence restraining order? Got it. So it's very similar to what it was prior to the stay in place order, but um, just so everyone knows, the stay in place order has caused the courthouses to, to essentially shut down except for essential functions. So if we're talking about divorce, child custody issues, those we can't file anything, but we can file domestic domestic violence restraining orders or request, and let's say properly, request for a domestic violence restraining order. So what, what the process is, is we fill out the pleadings, and I'm gonna give the Reader's Digest version here, is that the pleadings get completed, they get taken to the courthouse to request a temporary restraining order. The court, the judge that's sitting today or tomorrow or whatever business day it is, um, then reviews the pleadings on their face, so looks at what we filed, as far as testimony and determines whether or not a temporary restraining order is appropriate. Once the temporary restraining order gets granted, or if it doesn't get granted, the court sets a hearing sometime in the future to determine whether or not a permanent restraining order is, um, is necessary. The future usually is two to three weeks, but given that we're at a 30-day courthouse closure, um, who knows when that's going to be um, early May, I would assume at this point. Um, when you get the temporary restraining order, the court is going to um, make certain orders to protect the victim. They're going to be stay away orders, you know, stay away 100 yards, stay away from kids, stay away from school, stay away from work, which really doesn't apply now because most people aren't working. Um, and you can also ask for move out orders that the party be required to move from your residence. Um, also, let me, important. let me get this just so I understand this. Yeah. So when you get the permanent restraining order, all those things would happen, but even while you have the temporary restrain, uh, restraining order, those same things would happen. You'd have those same protections as though it was permanent. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, if we move into the permanent, so after the hearing on the restraining order, the court is going to, or may, depending on if it determines that a permanent order is appropriate. And permanent doesn't mean forever. It's either going to be three to five years, sometimes one year, depending on what the, the abuse allegations are. 
at that hearing, the court can make additional orders, orders for child support, spousal support, um, custody and visitation orders, um, things like that. And, and also unlawful recording orders. So you can record um, conversations or sorry, lawful recording orders. So you can record conversations between the, the parties. Um, the reasons for a restraining order are, you know, I, I want to say they're simple, but it's not, you know. So the family code section 6200 and beyond outlines what can be restrained and the conduct that can't be. And typically you're looking at conduct to be restrained as um, physical injury. Someone causes you a physical injury or someone causes reasonable apprehension that you're going to be physically harmed or someone disturbs your peace, which is, um, which is disturbing the mental calm, maybe sending hundreds of text messages a day, leaving voicemails, yelling, screaming. Disturbing the peace is a broad um, subject and it's really hard to get one of those. Uh, maybe not really hard, but you have to have a systematic um, continuing abuse to do that. Now, obviously a um, physical harm or reasonable apprehension of harm is an easier way to get a restraining order. Um, and, you know, the court's more likely to restrain that conduct than the uh, than just getting text messages and things like that. But it is possible that if it exceeds what would be considered reasonable and destroys your mental calm, that the court will order a restraining order. That makes sense. Um, you know, so uh, one of the obvious things here that we don't want to happen is that if someone's you know, being, if someone is a victim, if someone has the apprehension that they're going to be injured by you know, a boyfriend, you know, a girlfriend, uh, a spouse, because this applies to not only spouses, but it also applies to any kind of domestic relationship, correct? Right. So it's a, um, so you have to have a qualifying relationship and that's something I should have touched on earlier. Qualifying relationship, meaning children, um, spouses, parents, it's in the in a small blood separation. So, can you get a domestic violence restraining order against your extremely distant cousin? No, but you can get one against your mother or your father, or your father and mother can get one against you, your spouse, your your boyfriend. Uh, maybe maybe you had a one night stand and you have a child together. You can get a restraining order against that person too. Gotcha. Okay, good to know. If someone's in this situation, one of these qualifying relationships. Obviously, we don't want them to be stuck in a spot where because they're in the same house with the assailant, with the person that's causing them this harm, we don't want them to be uh, basically getting victimized just because they're filing one of these cases because they're doing it. So how can they go about getting a case filed, going through and filing a case and doing it quickly, like the time frames? Can you go into a couple of those aspects of, you know, these types of uh, restraining orders? Yeah, absolutely. So. If it's if there's physical violence and someone's been harmed, my advice is always going to be first call the call law enforcement um, because they can if, if you call and the police come out and they see that there's been domestic violence, they will arrest the person and take them away from the house. Um, so that's the number one thing to do. Then contact the attorney, contact us or even another attorney. Just contact someone to protect yourself. Um, then the attorneys can file the restraining order on your behalf. The way it works is when you file the request for temporary restraining order, it goes, you send it down to court. And let me backtrack here a little bit. Family law departments and domestic violence being a family law matter. Our family law departments are, um, you know, living in the stone age. Everything's still done paper filing. Whereas in most civil departments, you can do what's called e-filing where you can file it from, you know, from your desk. We can't do that in family court. We have to send down paper copies. So that's if terrible. someone retains- That's awful retains, for these types of cases. That's just, yeah. that's ridiculous. Why there's no, that's a terrible. It, exactly. So walking through the process and, and just, you know, using the process as though someone retained our office. So someone retains our office and let's say that it's not a, a, immediate harm issue. It's that someone's faced um, vi domestic violence in the past. They've been abused in the past and um, things are just boiling over in this stay in place order to where they don't feel safe. 
and there's been yelling and threats of more more harm. So let's say they retain our office. Usually in that situation, we're we're going to bump the restraining order to the top of the queue of the work that we're working on because it is urgent. Not to say the other stuff we're working on isn't, but this is protecting someone's life. We're going to gather all the evidence and the um, and the client's testimony. Usually, turn it around within 24 hours. Once we have everything completed and signed by the client, we're going to send it down to court with the process or a courier. Um, we use a courier because it makes things a little quicker. So the courier is going to take it into the court and probably wait a couple hours for the judge to review the pleadings and get them back. If they get them back and the person is and the court grants the temporary restraining order, then we're going to have the courier um, serve the restraining order on the, on the perpetrator that day so they can be removed from the house. The, the process server can't actually physically remove someone if there's a move out order. That's for, the, for law enforcement to do, but the process server will help, help assist in contacting law enforcement and advise the person they have, to leave. they have to move out. We can have a sheriff file the restraining order and the sheriff can physically remove the person, but the issue I see with that is that especially in this situation where people have nowhere they can go, um, is that the sheriff's service takes a while, you know, a couple hours, maybe a day or two, as opposed to having the process server serve the paperwork, which would be almost immediately after receipt. Um, and then if the person, if the, the perpetrator won't remove themselves from the property, then you can call law enforcement. And that segment of law enforcement will be out to your house sooner than the service branch would that makes sense so that's the so if you want to get this done the fastest way possible that'd be the way to do it exactly okay that's important because i think people are going to want to understand how that process works one part that you mentioned there was <clears throat> getting the client to sign on the paperwork i know under california law there's allowances for attorneys to sign off on certain things for their clients you know where there is an impossibility of the client signing off on it you know, this would definitely be one of those circumstances. So do you think that'd be something in this type of case, you would be able to sign off for your client on that paperwork to file it? I suppose we could, um, you know, we also, we also use DocuSign and other manners that could be discreet for the, for the client. Okay. So send it through DocuSign and they can just click on their phone, you know, go to the bathroom, click on their phone and sign it. So it's not as though we need a physical wet signature on it. Um, so there are things in place to help proceed or help. Okay. Expedite it. That's good. Everything that I'm thinking about right now in regards to this is how do you go through this process in secret? Because yeah. obviously this could be, you know, causing going through this process could be the thing that just blows, you know, the lid off with right. someone, a perpetrator that's, you know, so well, I could just it, see how it could be dangerous. Exactly. And like you said, in a, in a, normal scenario and i mean normal like you know life three weeks ago the person could file a restraining order and leave the house or go seek refuge at a at a friend's house or even a hotel or or some way of protecting themselves but with this stay in place order it, it makes it more difficult you're cooped up in the same house um, for days yeah i saw some numbers on a couple different um on a couple of different media sources that we're talking about, you know, domestic violence and what's happening right now with it. It's kind of scary. It's, uh, yeah. it's concerning because I, and also what happened, apparently it happened in China as well. There was, you know, as soon as stuff started opening up again, um, what did you hear? Have you been hearing about those types of things? Yeah, I have. And, and, you know, from an analytical standpoint, when we look at, at, um, and this is digressing off the, off the main topic, but when we look at, you know, search trends for um, divorce cases and child custody cases, they're right now, they're at the same, if not higher than they were at this time last year. And I think this, um, you know, stay in place order is, um, is causing that. The, the reality is, is that no one can make a move on it, but the, the search traffic is there and, and the keywords are still as, as um, search as they were a year ago. Wow. And that's, yeah, well, that's, that's crazy. Um, well, you know, I'm going to recommend for the audience, anybody watching this, if you are suffering from 
this type of if you have these circumstances going on at home if you're in that classification that uh, Ben was talking about in regards to being someone that is a victim of domestic violence even if you're not sure I would still recommend that you get in touch with Ben if you know someone who needs to get in touch with Ben share this video with them share the information you know with them I'm gonna put up right now some info on how to get in touch with Ben it's right there so that's uh, Ben's information it's uh, that's that's the uh, phone number and the email address to reach out to him Ben is that the only way people can get in touch with you you know you can you can call our office um, 619 440 5716 is the main number the other number works as well you can email us um, when you call our office we are you know, even though we're working remotely, we do have, um, you know, voice over internet. So it goes to my assistant, my paralegal. So they're going to answer the phones. Also, if you're watching this on Facebook, you can um, send a direct message on Facebook and we'll answer that as soon as possible. Um, Instagram messaging, you know, social media messaging, just in general, we'll answer it as soon as possible. Now, the reality is, is during business hours, if you call the phone line, you're probably going to get um, an answer quicker, but because you know we're not always checking our social media profiles. But I would say the social media within an hour um, tops, probably sooner than that. And after hours, if you send the if you um, you know do a social media request, you you'll get a pretty quick answer there. And then also by going to our website embryofamilylaw.com, we have a chat function that you can chat with someone. Um, or also submit a, an online um, online form, and that goes directly to our inboxes as well. So there's multiple ways to to communicate with us, and any one of them will work just as well. Great. And I'm going to just say one thing to the audience, anybody that does want to get in touch with Ben, if you have a general question, you can leave it in the comments. You know, I'm sure Ben will be more than happy to answer the question. If it's something that's, you know, a question that's posted on one of my you know, uh, one of my social media sources, you know, if it's on the Law Eagles or on my page, I'll share that with Ben and I'll make sure Ben can take a look at that and answer those questions. If it's something that's personal, please don't put it in the comments below any of these videos. Please do a private message to either me or to Ben and ask those questions directly to them. We don't want any kind of private question that's very personal. Uh, that people can see because these posts are public. We don't want anybody to see those and, you know, uh, make it known that you're seeking help for domestic violence or something of that, that nature. So just be aware of that, please. Uh, yep. So I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to go back to the video. And Ben, uh, I want to thank you so much for being on today. You did a great job and thanks for providing all this information to the audience. Yeah, Eric, thanks for having me and Look forward to seeing you as soon as this is over. You too, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good one. You too. Take care.